This is a, an experiment and we're building each week. So every single week we try something new and um, some things will work, some things will stick and others will be a complete train wreck and we won't do them you know, more than three times again. So uh, we're, we're just there. So ideally kind of when you're starting a new church, what you want to do is get a group of people together that are sold out, hardcore, passionate about following Christ and everybody starts getting jobs and responsibilities. That way it doesn't all sit on one person or a few families, things like that. And we're kind of in that phase of just gathering people. And then what we'll work towards is a launch. And we'll probably do that. I was looking at Easter of this year, but it's probably going to be more like fall after summer just because Easter's so late. And it's just, we'll, we'll just see. So that's what we're up to. That's what you're a part of. It's new. It's from the hip. A lot of times we're just trying to figure some stuff out. And so uh, if if God has called you to a more missional, missionary type mindset, this is a great spot for you. Um, if this is not your, your gig, then we want to help you find somewhere to plug in because there's a lot of great gospel preaching, uh, Bible submitting to churches out in Missoula, and we want to help you find that spot. So if this isn't it, there is no harm, no foul. You're not going to hurt anybody's feelings. We just want to get you squared away to where you can grow in your faith and really be used um, to reach the city for Christ. Okay, good? Cool. So we've been marching through Matthew. I'm going to pray, and we're actually going to start off in uh, Psalm 12. And uh, by the way, the reason I'm speaking so loud and wearing a microphone, last week I got the, uh, the comment like, hey, your mic wasn't doing anything. Um, the microphone is for the camera. So um, I'm just so vain that I want my, <laughs> I want my audio to be, be perfect. Um, so we haven't started using the PA yet. Uh, so that's, that's why if you're like, somebody needs to turn up his mic. It's not Jacob's fault. It's, that it's just not amplified. Okay. So I'm going to pray loud enough for everybody here. Father God, thank you so much for today, for Sunday, for another week, for the gift of life and the ability to just come here. And God, before we pray for us, I just want to pray for the other churches in Missoula. Uh, I pray that as your word is taught and preached and people sing songs about who you are and your salvation and your love and your greatness, God, I pray that those would not be empty words. Uh, I, I pray that there would be just this devout commitment and, and knowledge of mind and heart that people just say, Christ is it. He's my life and he's the hope for the world. And we, we put our faith there. And so, God, I pray that you would draw people who are far from Christ to the other churches in and around Missoula and that people would come to faith in Christ there and plug in and serve and reach this city. Um, God, and for us, I just pray that we would walk out of here different. I pray that we would be uh, really filled with your Holy Spirit and governed by your Holy Spirit and strengthened by your Holy Spirit. And God, as we dig into your word, I pray that you would help me to uh, be faithful and precise and accurate in what you have said and what you want us to know. And so, God, I pray that we would come with open hearts, open minds, uh, and open hands, just really willing to change our lives and yield our lives to what you have revealed to us in your word. And we thank you for the gift of your word and ask that we would, we would approach it reverently and humbly and trust that you're a loving and good father and you've given us instruction that leads to our life, uh, to life and to our good. We pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, so, um, so some of you might have a medical condition or know someone with a medical condition where they constantly have to do like a, a daily treatment or a daily uh, therapy or something of that nature. Um, I, I have a family member who's diabetic and she has to take insulin shots. I think it's every meal. I think it's with before every single meal or the food that she eats can put her in the hospital and, you know, potentially kill her. So I have told Margaret a number of times, um, I'm very much that same way in a spiritual sense. So if I'm not daily plugging in to Bible, and I call it my recalibration time, because I kind of deteriorate as the day goes on, right? And then in the mornings, I get up, I get about five o'clock because I've got four kids and I've got to beat them up. And I actually, technically, I was talking with my friend Weston about this at work this back week. I get up at 4.59 because I have to beat everybody that's getting up at five. So I get up at, my alarm goes off 4.59 in the morning and that is recalibration time for me. That is, that is prayer and that is Bible reading, Bible study, uh, journal to kind of get my thoughts ordered and so on and so forth. One of the things I found a little while ago that I started incorporating into my daily recalibration time um, is 
uh, I, I read a book on praying through the Psalms. And so what you do is you take the day of the month and you pick a Psalm. So like Tuesday was the 12th and I was in Psalm 12 and you can go through and it's not really like accurate theology time. It's like whatever God calls to mind. So you read a line and then you just pray about that and then you move on to the next verse and then you do that. And so if, if Psalm 12 doesn't work, then you can add 30 to it. And if that one doesn't work, which I think is 42, right? Then you add 30 to that and that'd be 72 and so on and so forth. So you find a Psalm that you jive with. If you struggle with prayer, this is a great way to learn how to pray. Just hit a Psalm, read a verse, pray about whatever comes to mind. You can also do it with the Proverbs. I really like doing it with the Proverbs as well, just because a lot of wisdom. I need wisdom. So imagine you might as well. So that's a good thing. So it was Tuesday the 12th and I was in Psalm 12. And I hit this Psalm and it was like bleak. But it was hope giving for me. It was life giving for me. This is really kind of a, a dark dismal Psalm. But for me it stood out and it was life giving because I saw in this that what we experience in the world right now, what we're going through when you turn on the news, when you see fights uh, uh, in your office spaces or in your families or uh, what have you, when you see the darkness growing in the world around you, this isn't new and nothing's catching God off guard. Right? God's in control, and I was able to relate. If you've ever had anybody, like you've been in a bad spot and someone could come along and relate to you, the psalmist here in Psalm 12 was able to relate here. So Psalm 12, 1 through 8 says this. It's in your notes. If you guys can't see the screen over here, we'll have to clearly get more screens. All right. Or change the shape of the room again. All right. So Psalm 12, 1 through 8 says, Save, O Lord. Right? It's a prayer. Save, O Lord, for the godly one is gone. Right? There's no more godly people. For the faithful have vanished from among the children of man. Everyone utters lies to his neighbor. Right? You see lying all over the place in our society. This is not new. With flattering lips and a double heart they speak. Right? Their, their heart's divided. Which we were talking about the other week about being pure in heart. Right? They're up to something that they're not revealing. May the Lord cut off all flattering lips, the tongue that makes great boasts. Those who say, with our tongue we will prevail. Our lips are with us. They're saying we can lie our way and manipulate our way out of us, right? We can talk our, ourselves out of that. Who is master over us? That resonates right now, right? There's no God. We've descended, you know, whatever by random chance from space dust. Like, no one's ma I'm master, captain of my own ship, right? Who is master over us? Verse 5, because the poor are plundered. Because the needy groan, I will now arise, says the Lord. One of the things you see in both Old and New Testament is God's concern for those who are marginalized, for the, for the poor, the widow, the orphan, the broken, right? Uh, because the poor are plundered, because the needy moan, I will now arise, says the Lord. I will place him, that's the poor, in safety for which he longs. The words of the Lord are pure words, like silver refined in a furnace on the ground, purified seven times. Important verse for us right there is verse six, right? Um, if you're looking for hope and you're looking for truth and you're looking for how to navigate the world that we're in, you have to, have to, have to know your Bible. You have to read your Bible even when it's tough. You've got to get through and, and keep rocking and rolling. The, Lord, the words of the Lord are pure. You, O Lord, will keep them. You will guard us from this generation forever, right? This evil generation. On every side, the wicked prowl as vileness is exalted among the children of man. So pretty bleak psalm, right? I mean, it's like kind of dark. He's just painting this picture of just spiritual depravity. And it's like, hey, good morning. Welcome to church. Everybody's wicked, right? And I'll tell you, I was, it was, I was downstairs. I was in the basement. It was Tuesday the 12th, Psalm 12, right? And so I'm just sitting there and I'm like, this is real life. Like the Bible's real. It's real life. You deal with real things. And I was able to connect with, I'm, I believe David wrote this. I believe it, King David who wrote this. Um, I was able to sit and lament with him because I'll tell you, we've talked in the Beatitudes about uh, blessed are those who grieve, right? Or mourn. Blessed are those who mourn, right? So blessed are those who look at sin and depravity and evil and it grieves them. And I would, I would say that's me right? I mean, I'm not perfect by any means. It's not a judgment type thing. It's just like, oh, I hate what my sin does and I hate what others' sin has done to them. So what I've noticed a lot is this is, this is kind of an accurate por portrait of what I think I see out in the world when I'm out and about and watching on the news and things like that. 
And what I see from a lot of folks, be it uh, in a political sphere or in a church sphere, is a lot of, this is real. What do we do? There's a lot of, a lot of hand wringing and nervousness and fear and is it the end of the world and what's going on and what's happening. Um, and we're going to be back in Matthew. We're going to be continuing in Matthew 5 where Jesus is talking about the ethics of the kingdom. Right? This is his kingdom. He's going to talk about salt and light today. He's going to talk about engagement. And what we want to do is we want to replace hand wringing and worry and fear and anxiety with action. Right? We want to have a, a plan for how we're going to engage the darkness because you're going to want to actually do something about it. So when you were called to follow Christ, when Jesus made that invitation to you, it wasn't just turn away from your sin, receive Jesus, and then you get to go to heaven when you die. Right? That, that wasn't it. That was part of it, but that wasn't the whole thing. You were actually invited into a mission. And so your life right here, right now, in your workplaces, in your families, in your neighborhoods, in your churches, everywhere, you're supposed to be engaged, which brings us to our first point. So the job description of Christ's disciple is not fulfilled by personal, private holiness. True Christians engage the world. All right? So the job description of Christ's disciples, someone that is truly, actually, genuinely following Jesus, taking on his values, taking on his mission, submitting to his word, that job description, if he goes, here's your deal, boom, ever been interviewed for a job, right? And they go, here's what you're going to do, here's your responsibilities. It is not fulfilled by personal private holiness. Now, is personal private holiness a part of it? Absolutely, obviously. Yes. But you're not doing your whole job. If, if uh, you're interviewing for a job and they go, here are your four job responsibilities, and you go, I'm going to do two of them really well, right? Hire me. I'm your top guy. You're not going to get hired, hopefully, unless they're desperate, right? So Jesus comes in and he says, listen, personal private holiness, it's a big deal. Absolutely yes and amen. We have kind of fallen into this weird spot. Kind of at the, it's kind of been like the last 120 years of the church where it's just, it's just me and God, and it's none of y'all's business, kind of what I've got going on with the Lord. That's not biblical. There's nothing biblical about that. Now, is it supposed to be me and the Lord, and I connect to Him, and walk with Him? Yes, absolutely. But then I'm supposed to engage the darkness, right? So we said true Christians engage the world. So let's get to our Matthew passage. This is a fairly famous one. You'll hear people talk about, oh, salt and light, salt and light, this is it. And so we're going to just kind of dissect what that means. Okay, so Matthew 5, 13 through 16. So Jesus talked to his disciples, and this is an emphatic you. You, you, only you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. Okay, so he just went from salt to light. We got a, a, another metaphor here. You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, right? So you get a light. The whole point is to, you know, eradicate darkness. And he's saying people don't do that and then put it under something in order to hide the light. Okay, so you don't hide the light of Christ that you have. But on a stand, and it gives light in all the house. Verse 16, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Now here's a just real interesting little spiritual truth for us. If you have the light of Christ, which earlier in Matthew it says a great light has come into the world, and that's Jesus. He's now here. He's going to shine in the darkness. If you are in Christ, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit fills you. You now have a, a one of the members of the Trinity living inside of you, and that light gives light to the world. So you actually have this light. Now it doesn't originate from you. It's not that you're super awesome and you're the light and the hope of the world. But if you walk with Christ, there's, some, there's, a, there's a dignity in that, right? There's this hope, there's this thing that you can now bring to the world. Now, interestingly, I was talking about the personal piety type thing. Um, do I have any 80s kids in here? Anybody that grew up in the 80s dating yourself, right? Okay, so, <laughs> so I'm not sure if I want to raise my hand on this and date myself. Um, anybody remember glow worms? 
at all? Yes. Do you remember? Like they were a toy that you could, there was a show and then there was a toy that was a glow worm that you could get. And it was like when Wendy's was trying to have Happy Meals to compete with McDonald's and they would give you this toy and it was a glow worm. And it was one of those things that if you hold it in front of the, the lamp and then turn the lights off, it glows, right? Right? So that's a glow worm. You know, if you're an 80s kid, you might have had the star stickers up on your ceiling. Is that, I'm getting more nods on that one. You guys had the stickers that were up on your ceiling. And so you would just like, before bedtime, you'd charge them up with the light on and then they'd dim down and then you'd light up again and then your mom would come in a rage and then you'd just, just like, turn the light off, right? And that whole thing. So you understand that material, right? It's in the light and it gets light, not of itself, but then it can go in the darkness and it glows. Okay, that's personal piety, that's personal spiritual relationship with Jesus. You get, you're a glow worm, baby, right? You get in, in and around Christ, he fills you with light, and then you go out there. So the light is not of you, it is the Holy Spirit in you, and you are recharged like a glow worm or the stars on the ceiling, spending more time with Christ. So... One of the things that I'm just going to try to develop and develop and develop is you and your personal walk, your personal relationship with Christ. So, so that was light. Just a couple things I want to talk about light. So I want to get through here real quick, and we're just going to roll through these fast. Salt. What does it mean to be salt of the earth? So you got to remember context here. For those of you who can't see the screen, sorry, I'll try not to stand in the way. It says salt preserves, right? So think of rotting meat. You go, you go hunt, and what they would do is they would take an animal, uh, you know, the meat, and they would make a saline solution, right? So water and salt, and they would dip the, the meat in there, and then it would, you know, absorb the salt, and then that's how it, you preserve meat, okay? To keep it from rotting. Salt preserves. Salt also flavors. Some of you put too much salt on your food, right? These vegetables are terrible. I'm going to load up and shake the salt out of the out of the shaker and it's going to make my green beans a whole lot better. It also causes thirst, right? Salt causes thirst. So let's just talk about you and just ask a couple personal questions real quick. Are you preserving rot around you? And when I say rot, I mean moral rot and decay. I mean spiritual rot. I mean the rot of families. I mean the rot of your businesses, your city, your society. Be honest with yourself. Right? One day you're going to stand before Jesus. You're not going to be able to lie to you or him anymore. So let's be honest now. Am I preserving rot? Or am I just kind of there? Next one. Salt flavors. Do teams or workplaces or neighborhoods improve because you're there bearing the light of Christ? Is that real? Is that true for you? Right? Jesus has the words of life. Psalm 12, right, articulates really kind of the, where the world is um, when you step into that. Is it better because you're there? Do you walk into your meetings at work and people are like, oh, good, so-and-so's here, right? Do you show up at a, at, a, at a Bible study or your kid shows up on a baseball team or soccer team or whatever and people are like, oh, good, glad they're here? Or is it like, oh, Evade, 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 right? Like you're just trying to get away to, get, to keep the drain from happening. Do you actually make things taste better? Do you flavor these things better? Uh, last one on salt. Do you cause thirst? If I hung out with you, would I be like, man, I wish I had a relationship. Now, I know that you guys are mostly coming from a Christian perspective, right? So alter this a little bit for those who aren't believers. But when they get around you, or I get around you, but I go, man, I'm really thirsty for what that person has. I really hunger for what that person, that type of connection, that type of peace with God, that type of kind of like that underlying, not wacky, goofy, weirdo Christian joy, but like, man, this is a person that can step into dark spots. Like, uh, I actually want what that person has. Do you create that thirst? Because Jesus says that's actually your job description, Okay. And if that's not you, great. Today is a day to change direction. Okay? Right? Don't, don't lie to yourself. Be like, yep, got it. But that's the job description. Preserve flavor, cause thirst. Light dispels darkness. Obviously, it's dark. You turn on a light. You get that. Okay? Darkness goes away when you bring light into the situation. Light reveals hidden dangers. Okay? Ever been walking through um, room at night, and then all of a sudden you find... Uh, it's a, a light pain, like smacking your, your shin into a coffee table. Like that's 
sounds like a very bad pain to some of you, but it's nothing compared to stepping on a Lego that you didn't see, right? Which is, that's a 10, okay? My wife's delivered kids. I've had kidney stones, and we have had conversation about which one of those is worse. Fortunately, her sister actually had kidney stones and gave birth, and she was like, kidney stones. And I was like, <laughs> victory. I've passed two kidney stones two separate times, and stepping on Legos is worse. <laughs> Just kidding, right? So no, it, it reveals hidden dangers. So spiritually speaking, when God's word comes to bear on situations of your life, okay, God can show like, hey, if you do this with money, it's going to be a massive problem. If you do this with sex and relationships, it is going to be a danger for you. If you do this with substance, right, it's going to be a danger for you. If you treat your parents this way, if you treat your kids this way, if you do this with time, it reveals danger, right? So God's word can be that for you. Uh, lastly, light exposes dirt which we're going to say sin, right? It just shows us, like, hey, I've got this thing that's out of alignment. I've got this thing that's wrecking me. It's killing me. It's in opposition to God's character, and it's sin. And the Bible is this really interesting thing because you read it, and as you're reading it, it reads you, right? And it's like, hey, you are greedy, right? I can read the Bible, and it'll go, hey, Brad, you're greedy. And I'm like, I love these morning meetings, you know? <laughs> Right? Hey, you are lustful. Hey, you are wrathful. Hey, you are lazy. Like the Bible will show us that. And so people, John 3 says, the light comes in the world and people flee. They're like, I'm out of here. I don't want to see any of this. Right? It's your reaction, mine. Okay, we all react the same way. But what God calls us to is, hey, come into the light. That way you might live. Turn away from these things that are wrecking you and killing you. Right? Walk in these. So, so that's light, okay? So salt preserves flavors and causes thirst. Light dispels darkness, reveals hidden dangers, and exposes dirt. That's sin. Okay? So when Jesus says, hey, here's your job description. That's what you're supposed to do. Good? Now he says something funky. Right? I always love getting on the interwebs and seeing the memes that people create. Right? That'll, that'll um, an, an example, they're, you know, an atheistic type meme where they will try to show how silly Christianity is. And one of them would be like Jesus turning water to wine and somebody writes out this chemistry thing where you change this atom in water over to wine and there's this nuclear explosion, destroys the whole earth and therefore Jesus couldn't have changed water to wine because it would have caused a nuclear holocaust. Right? See those types of things. Sometimes people will approach this thing with salt, losing its saltiness and they'll come at it like a chemistry lesson. like. Sodium chloride is a very stable compound. True, right? How does sodium chloride lose its sodium chloride-ness? It doesn't bond very well with other things. Once it's, they're hooked up, sodium chloride, right? They, they kind of mate for life. What do you do, right? And they approach this thing like a chemistry lesson. Jesus is not giving a chemistry lesson here, right? So what is he saying with this salt? How does salt actually lose its taste? So here's your next line here. Salt only loses its taste by being diluted. All right? That means adding the values of the world to the values of Christ's kingdom. Okay, remember what I was telling you about, right? So they would go, they'd get some meat, they'd kill an animal, and they would want to preserve it, so they would create a saline solution. They'd throw the meat in the saline solution, all the salt would soak in, they'd pull it out, ta-da, meat's preserved. How do you lose your saltiness? More water, more water, more water, more water, more water. And so what Jesus is talking about here is this idea of salt losing its taste. You lose your taste by being diluted by adopting the values of the world around us, by adopting the way that they approach money or sex or time or, or whatever, right? What is my life for, right? The more I, man, this is, I'm just gonna step on some toes. I love you, but like, look, the more I, I normalize the things that I see on TV, the weirder and weirder Christ's kingdom and values are gonna be for me, okay? So I ingest all this stuff, and that's just taking the salt and pouring water and pouring water and diluting, 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 okay? Some of us are struggling with this vibrant life with Christ or this impact, right? We, the, the salt stuff, right, is preserving, flavoring, causing thirst because we've totally diluted ourselves with the values of the world. And let's not beat around the bush here. 
Christ is at odds with selfishness and greed and, and wrath and hatred and laziness and sloth and love. Like he's at odds with that. Okay, so if you're going to follow Christ, the job description is separation. I don't mean hiding. I mean my values and my, my, my desires and my hopes are, are His, right? I love the things that Jesus loves and I hate the things that Jesus hates. Like that's what I'm taking on. Um, Jesus is praying about this idea. In John chapter 17, He's about to go to the cross here. And He's praying for His disciples. He said, I've given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world just as I am not of the world. Okay, when it says of the world, that doesn't mean in that moment that he came from heaven, although true. It's that my values, the way that I do things, the way that we accomplish stuff, is not the way of the world. The way that we advance society, the way that we rescue, the way that we change anything is not the way of the world. Okay, right now, if you turn on the, t the TV, what you see is a lot of people trying to get top-down power to force their will on others. Absolutely not biblical. Grassroots volunteer. Think prodigal son, right? Prodigal son goes to his dad. Dad, you're dead to me. Give me the inheritance. Dad goes, I'm heartbroken. Okay, here you go. Son leaves. It wasn't, no, you're mine. You stay here forever, right? Does that make sense? That's not the nature of God. It's not top-down force. Son goes off, wrecks his life, hits rock bottom. Hey, it was a lot better in dad's house. He goes back. The father runs out to him, throws his robe around him. Beautiful, okay? That's how that gets done. So when you start thinking about the darkness of Psalm 12 that we started with, my question is, are you trying to change and improve the world top-down force? I'm going to force my will on others, right? Because that's what you see a whole lot. Jesus says, I'm not of the world. His prayer continues in verse 15. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, right? His disciples, they're not of the world. Their values aren't the same. Um, their, their, their methods aren't the same. Just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them in truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. You've been sent. It's part of your job description. But you go with values that are at odds with the world. Uh, there's an example of a guy who started in discipleship, right? He starts following Christ. And in 2 Timothy, um, he starts with following Jesus. And then he kind of realizes, man, I just, just love the world, right? So his name's Demas. And so Demas, 2 Timothy 4.10. For Demas, in love with this present world, has deserted me. Oh, P.S. This is Paul. He's on a, on a mission trip. He had people that ra rallied around him that uh, helped accomplish ministry. Demas was one of them. All right? And he's saying to Timothy, he's writing to a young pastor named Timothy, he's saying, hey, come quickly because Demas has abandoned me. Right? He's in love with this present world and has deserted me. He's gone to Thessalonica. Okay? Uh, and then he tells you these other two guys that we'll throw in for good measure. Um, Crescens? Cretans. Cretans. Crotians, whatever his name is, you should name your kid after him, has gone to Galatia. Titus to Dalmatia. Now, Titus was a good guy, so what I, my understanding of these two guys is they were just called other ministry fields. They weren't Demas. Demas was in love with the world. He left. He's like, I'm out. I want to do life the way the world does life. I want to do relationships and money and time and blah, 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 the way the world does that. And so Demas is out. And make no bones about it, this could be any one of us. Right? We could fall in love with the world and chase after worldly things. Now there's a big theological conversation that we won't have right there about whether you lost your salvation or you were ever actually saved and da 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 da. We're not going to get into that. I just wanted to bother you. Okay? First John. One more aspect here of diluting, right? How do I dilute myself with the values of the king? First John 2, 15 through 17. Okay, this is the Apostle John. This is one of the twelve. This is, uh, this is the John, son of Zebedee that we learned about a few chapters ago in Matthew. He's writing... To, uh, to a church that he serves. And he says, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Right? And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. Now, quick point. 
you should, if you are familiar uh, with John 3.16, right, the verse that you see all over the place, you should have a little red light going, wait, 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 that's a Bible contradiction, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. God loved the world, but the Bible's telling me not to love the world, right? So we've got to put those things together, okay? We've got a little, little, little mild contradiction action going on here. There's a way that you love others without loving their sin, loving their values, okay? Jesus comes in John 3, you know, God sends his son in John 3, is the, is the passage, teaching of John 3, 16, and he looks at the world and says, man, you're all caught up in idols, and you're all caught up in death, all these things are killing you and wrecking you, and I love you, and I want to rescue you. Now, why is this important to us? We live in an era right now that says, if you disagree with what I am doing, what I am saying, what I am thinking, you hate me. Right? This is very, very, very pertinent to what we've got going on in the world. You are called to love people without loving the things that are killing them. Okay, so there's a way to love the world and there's a way to not love the world. Does that make sense? So there's people that will look and they'll say, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live this way, I'm going to do this, I'm going to behave here, blah, 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 whatever they're doing. And if you don't affirm and celebrate everything that I am saying, thinking, and doing, you don't love me. False. Not biblical. Okay? In fact, a lot of times it seems that people that come along and celebrate whatever the worldly value is, whatever the thing is, right, that they're doing that, that's not because of love, that's because of selfishness and fear. Okay? So important. So important, okay? It's not I love you even though you value this thing over here, whatever it is. It's that I love me and I love your praise and I love the applause of the world and I'm afraid of consequence and recourse. That's not love. For a Christian, a light bearer, a salt D person, right, to step in and go, I'm going to speak about this thing that you value over here, that you love, that you treasure over here, I'm going to get hit by a truck, right? When you come with Christian values and go, I love you so much, I don't want to see you wrecked and destroyed by sin. When I pick my head up and go, hey, I love you, that's going to kill you, you just picked your head up and you're now in, in the crosshairs, right? You are now in the line of fire. And so you as Christians, the, the, the counter to this whole notion of if you don't love and celebrate and affirm, you don't love me, is false. And your counter to that is actually I love you enough to where I'm going to get just hit, I'm going to get punched, it's going to cause problems. And I love you so much, I want to see you set free from this sin. Does that make sense? So we track and we get the idea, the notion there. So Jesus loves the world, but he doesn't love the world. Does that make sense? We are called to love the world, but not love the world. Tracking? Are we, are we making sense there? No Bible contradictions? Everybody's still Christian? Good. Let's move on to how you, uh, or why, we hide light. Um, this is harsh. Sorry, I wrote this harsh because the Bible's harsh on this one. All right, I'm not trying to take uh, digs or jabs at you on this one. It's just the language of the Bible. The light of Christ, so we're moving from salt, we're moving to light. Uh, the light of Christ in a professing Christian, and I got scare quotes around that because I think there needs to be some assessment about am I truly, genuinely saved if I'm not salt and light. But the light of Christ in a professing Christian is hidden by cowardice or apathy. All right, I'm choosing cowardice. I could have said fear. That's the more like, oh, yeah, we all have fears kind of thing. But I'm just like, you're a coward. Like, that's just what I'm trying to say here. And just in case anybody's curious about that. Uh, <laughs> glad you're here, man. All right. The reason I'm using that is because that's the language that Revelation uses. And I, and I want you to see the gravity of you being absolutely dominated by fear. So much so that you forsake the mission that you're on, okay? Uh, in the book of Revelation, uh, always a fun one to get into because there's all kinds of ways to get into debate about this, but we're not going to do it today. Just Revelation 21. Um, Jesus talking here. He says this in verses 7 through 8. He says, the one who conquers. Now, you'll hear me say this a number of times. We're an invading force, right? Christians, the church, 
is an invading force. Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. Gates of hell will not stand against it. Gates are defensive. We're an invading force. To the one who conquers, I will have this heritage. Side note, that's not with blades and bullets, okay? Remember, not of this world, different value system, okay? The one who conquers, I have... Uh, I will have this heritage. Sorry, let's try this again. The one who conquers will have this heritage. There we go. And I will be his God, and, they, uh, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, okay, that's the Bible word for it, right? It's not just those who are just kind of afraid and timid. It's like for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable. As for murderers, look at what he's pairing cowardice with, is murder. That's like heavy. Cowardice is paired with murder. And next, the sexual, sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. And I just like that he pairs lying with murder also. That's a fun one. Okay. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. He's talking about destruction and perishing in hell there. For the cowardly. Puts them with the murderers, puts them with the sexually immoral, puts them with liars. Right? Put them in the idolaters, and that's a key part of this, right? Because why am I afraid? What am I afraid of? Right? A lot of times, I am afraid of what other people think of me. I'm afraid of the consequences of my actions, of being salt and light in the world, with engaging in the darkness, right? I'm afraid of that. And really what's going on is I've got some sort of distortion or brokenness in my picture of God. And if I'm shaking and terrified and gripped with fear and overwhelmed and controlled by fear and I am cowardly, what does that really say about what I know of God? Do I truly know the Lord? Does he know me? Am I indeed filled with the Holy Spirit? It's challenging, right? Like some of you are just fidgeting. It's uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable when I was studying it. Right? This is one of those that I was, I was telling you. Like, it was just reading me. And I was like, man, what am I afraid of? I'll tell you, I, I wrestle with fear. Okay? One of the big fears for me right now is I see all of the conversation going on on, on, on social media surrounding uh, the issue of abortion in New York and Virginia. And it's like, I know I'm supposed to speak into this. I know I want to speak into this. I know I'm not like rabid, crazy kind of, you know, picketing Molotov cocktail type guy. I'm supposed to be in this, but there's this part of me that's like, I just have no interest in being part of that conversation because it's just like nasty and it's messy and it's, it's like there's this fear that I wrestle with and it's like, do the right thing, right? Because we all look back on history and we talk about uh, how the, the, these Christians would do nothing in Nazi Germany when all of these Jews are taken off to slaughter. And it's like, you're supposed to do something. Why didn't you? I would have done something. Well, here we are, aren't we? Right? And I'll be forthright. Like, I, like, I'm sitting there and I'm reading this. I'm like, okay, cowardly, faithless, detestable, murderers, sexually immoral, social, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars. And I'm like, how big is my God? How big is my God? Right? Do I know Jesus? Am I filled with the power of his Holy Spirit? Is there strength in my relationship with God for me to, in this particular conversation, which is just incredibly big, incredibly nuanced, and incredibly sensitive, right? To be salt and light in that conversation. And some of that means reigning in the psychotic hostility of the Christians, right? Some of that means like, hey, you're approaching this issue with the values of the world, right? Your top-down force name-calling with hatred. Okay, so, and, and then there's this other conversation of, hey, here's life. Here's where life begins, right? There's, there's either side of that, and there's this part of me that's like, I, I feel compelled to get engaged in that conversation and engage both sides of that thing, right? So, so that's me, that's mine. I don't know what yours is, right? I'm just trying to like, tell you what, what, where I'm like, whoo, this was convicting for me, Right? I will hide my light. I'll take the light that Christ has given me and I'll put it under a basket because of my fear. Or my apathy, right? So a little lighter topic, right? That was a big heavy one for today. Congrats, you made it through. Okay, the other one is just apathy, right? Book of Revelation, we'll stay there. Um, Jesus is speaking to a church here. 
And this is Laodicea, uh, Laodicea, I believe, is the church we got going on here. And this is a passage that normally gets misinterpreted. Revelation 3, 15 through 17 says, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Now, what people usually do with this is they take the cold and they make it English slang. English slang. There we go. Slang. Right? So our slang in English is, oh, he's cold to the idea, or she's cold, right? She's turned off completely, right? If I, if I say, man, I approached that girl for her digits, and she was totally cold, that's English slang. That's, that's just the way that we use the word, and the idea is she's completely turned off to it, right? The other idea is, I'm hot, I'm on fire for Jesus, right? So that's, that's generally what people do with this passage. Jesus wants you to either be on fire for Jesus, or completely turned off to him. Does that sound biblical? Right? Does that sound even remotely close? Here's a question. Um, is cold water good for something? Yeah, hot day, drink cold water. It's good. Is hot water good for something? Yeah, cold winter days, hop in your hot tub, get in the shower. I spend a lot of time because we don't have a hot tub and I'm from Florida and it's ridiculously cold outside. So my normal, I, like I, this is just neurotic Brad, like I time myself in the shower to see how fast I can go, right? I will set a timer with my wife upstairs, she's on the middle floor, and I'll turn on her phone and start the timer, and I will run down the stairs, take a shower, do the face regimen, because she does face cream stuff, right? And so I'm supporting, right? And I'm just kind of like brushing my teeth, and I'm back up, and I'm like, woo, eight minutes, Whoosh, right? It's like, it's like you're trying to get that eight second thing where you like flip over the hog and tie it up except mine's eight minutes, okay? In the winter, it's hot in the shower. And so my eight minute showers are like 28 minute showers because I just sit there and shake and try to get my core temperature up. Is cold water good for something? Yeah, is hot water good for something? Yeah, absolutely. What's the problem? It's lukewarm, right? The problem here is lukewarm. Look at what he says. So I know your works. You're neither good as cold water or good as hot water, right? Either one, you could be on either end of the spectrum. Would that you were either cold or hot. So, because you are lukewarm, you're kind of middle ground, you're straddling the fence, you're, meh, I'm kind of in, I'm out, I'm apathetic, right? You could ride off to the side there, just apathetic. You're neither cold nor hot, I will spit you out of my mouth, for you say I am rich. I have prospered, I need nothing, uh, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. <laughs> I love Jesus' clarity, right? It's just... Just in case you were feeling good about yourself, you've been to your self-esteem classes and doing your daily affirmations, here you go. Okay, what's going on with the church at Laodicea is they've, they've blossomed financially. They'd be good Americans. They've done well. And what's happened to them is what Proverbs 30 talks about is they've forgotten God because of their wealth. Right? I'm good, I have nothing, I don't need to worry about it, right? Because that becomes the distraction. How do I preserve my wealth? How do I enjoy my wealth? How do I uh, push away the troubles and difficulties of, the life, of this life? And that was, what was what was going on. And so Jesus goes and he goes, no, no good on apathy. Right? So one of the things that I want to do with our church is just like point. Like, look, there's pain, there's sorrow, there's suffering, there's death, there's chaos, there's, there's just relational carnage everywhere. And engage care, mourn, blessed are those who mourn, see the pain, see the suffering, see the dark, open your eyes to it, and engage. We cannot be apathetic if we're following Jesus, right? He had a better setup in heaven than any one of us has going on here in our wealth and our comfort. He saw pain, and he goes, I'm in, right? And he steps into history, he puts on human flesh, he adds humanity to his divinity, he lives a perfect life, and he goes to the cross because he loves us. Didn't have to. So if we follow Jesus, it's what we do. We care. It matters to us, right? We have to see pain, sorrow, suffering, and death. So, what is our current plan? So last, last thing, we'll end on action steps. What are, we, what are we going to be doing as you are uh, testing to see if, man, this is where God has me as a, as a believer for this season of life. This is the church God wants me to plug into. What is our current plan for engagement at One Missoula Church? Remember, first point was Christians engage the world. So last point is, what are we going to do? 
How are we going to approach this? I'm going to speak in general terms mostly uh, in this, but there's some distinctions that I want you to catch, okay? Um, and by the way, I underlined current. You should have written in current there, okay? And the reason you wrote in current is because we as a church are subject to sanctification. Make sense? So what I mean by that is we can change course. So a lot of times I've been in, I've been in serving churches and we'll change plans and people will be like, why didn't we stick to the plan? We have a plan. Why didn't we stick to the plan? Arr! And then there's all this just craziness and division of we had a plan and everything that Brad says always changes. And it's like, yeah, that does happen a lot, you know? So that's real. And the reason is Jesus says that if you abide in him, you bear much fruit. Apart from him, you can do nothing. He says, if you're a branch that bears fruit, he prunes you. He comes in, he's like, oh, that's good. He's going to cut that off, right? And we're going a different course. So, Everything I'm about to say to you is subject to change. So, throw your lives into it fully. Okay. So, um, first one. Cur current plan for engagement is this. Uh, kind of phase area one is going to be a healthy church. We're trying to build a healthy church. Okay. Um, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. I have a concern about church world at large, and it is this. We are growing large uh, crowds of people that are dominated by sin, and they are um, questionably walking with Christ and there's just chaos and pain and then we take people that are far from Christ and we attach them to that thing and they just catch the disease of the host. Right? Make sense? So we want a healthy church. We've got to have a healthy church. How are we going to accomplish that? Uh, I've already hit on this today. Uh, personal connection with God. And I wrote John four, or 15, 4 through 5 in there for you to go check out. That's the verse I just quoted. Right? I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me, this is Jesus talking, if a man remains in me, he will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You need to be abiding, abiding in Christ. I told you you're glow worms, right? You're the, you're the glow in the dark stickers. You have to sit and bask in the light. You don't have light of your own that is recharged by time with Christ, right? So you have to have a personal connection with God. So I'm just going to ask you point blank do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? Okay, we're going to get to Matthew 7, and he's going to say uh, that not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. There are going to be people who call themselves Christians who won't. And he's going to say, uh, at the end of that, he's going to say, uh, they, they go through and say, we did all this religious stuff. And he says, those things you did, those were unauthorized. I never knew you. Relationship. Do you know Jesus? Do you have Jesus, have you repented of your sin? Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Are you genuinely, truly Christian? More on that when we get to Matthew 7. We're still in Matthew 5, okay? Um, next, Sunday teaching and training. And I gave you some verses there to see what was going on. Here's where I am philosophically um, on Sunday. So one way that you can set up church gathering the church's people, gathering on Sunday, is you set it up to make it very, very accessible for those who are far from Christ. So the strategy would be, hey, go get your friends, bring them here, I'll tell jokes and teach them about Jesus, and hopefully they receive Jesus. Okay? That's a strategy. It can work. Okay? Generally, um, it can be a good, healthy thing. Can be, can be, can be. It's not the approach that we're going to take. What we're going to do is, uh, you're the plan. You're the evangelism strategy. So what we're going to do on Sunday morning is teach and train. I want you to be able to walk out, go into your workplaces, families, Thanksgiving dinner, whatever, right, into the team that you're on, etc., etc., and you are equipped to, first and foremost, articulate what you believe. What is the gospel? If I sat down with you and I was like, what is the gospel? I bet some of you would be like, <laughs> yeah, and there would be this fumbling around. So I want to get you trained on it. What is the gospel? Okay, I want to get you trained on answering common objections to Christ. I want to get you trained on these things. So we're going to use Sunday morning as what do we, what do we believe and training for evangelism. Okay, Part of the healthy church thing is I want to train you in biblical counseling as well on Sunday morning. So that when you're in a small group, you're in a house church or whatever, and you've got a brother or sister in Christ who you know is just dominated by alcohol. Right, dominated by some sort of substance, that you are equipped and trained. God has sovereignly placed you there in that relationship, and you go, here we go. We're in. I'm scared out of my mind. Right? 
which by the way, as a pastor who's been in those conversations, I'm scared of my mind every time too. That's not a reason not to engage, okay? It's like, oh, there's a lot on the line right now and I am not equipped for this, okay? But I believe that God calls us to be in community so that when you know each other's junk and stuff that you are going to know that God has called you, you to engage and do it. So Sunday is going to be training time for believers. It is going to be done in such a way that those who are far from Christ can come and understand what's going on, okay? We will, be, we will be sensitive to those who are far from Christ. But the point of Sunday morning is a gathering of the saints. Good? So that's going to be a distinction that we have from others, okay? So some of you, that freaks you out in a church that, that the strategy is a little bit lower hurdle on Sunday morning, a little less heavy weighty, that you think, man, I'm just going to bring my neighbors to that. That's going to be easier and more accessible for them. That might be where you need to go. And I don't mean like get out. I mean like be sensitive to where the Holy Spirit is leading you and understand the strategy. Our strategy is you and that person and coffee for months or years, right? You. Not bring them to see Brad so they can pet my magical unicorn mane and come to Jesus. Like that's not what we're doing, okay? So, Next one is this, for a healthy church. I came across this a few weeks ago talking to a pastor in Jacksonville, and I love this. I love this. Groups of two or three for Bible study, prayer, and confession. You've got your verses to check out there. So, Bible says where two or more are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. Um, one of the things that we've really kind of not emphasized heavily uh, in the church in the last really couple decades, or about the last 20 years, is one-on-one -on -one discipleship. Like one-on-one, -on -one, two people getting together and maybe throw in a third, and there is bone gut level honesty about confession of sin. Here's where I'm being dominated. Porn's killing me right now. Alcohol is just absolutely owning me right now, right? I am enraged with my children way more than I like cuddling and playing with them. Right? Like, you can just be bone level honest about these things, and you have someone to pray for you. You're confessing your sin. That's one of the verses I threw in there was confess your sins one to another. I think that's the James path, James 5, right? Confess your sins one to another. And I'm also thinking this. What if, because everybody kind of gets confused about, I want to read the Bible, but I'm going to mess that up. What if two or three of us are getting together, and we're just reading, we're going to go through James, okay? Five chapters in James. So week one, we just read James 1, the same, same chapter, James 1, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, then we get together, what'd you see? Sounds boring, but when it comes to the Bible, there's raking for leaves, and then there's digging for gold. And a lot of times, you don't see that gold until like, the fourth, fifth, sixth time that you've like really wrestled with something. And so you get together and you go, okay, here's where we are. So anyway, so it's this idea of gathering together in groups. Um, and then the last one, number four, is future house churches. And there's an asterisk next to that. <laughs> okay? I have this crazy idea that Sunday could be a gathering of house churches. Right? We gather for central teaching, some worship, Right? On Sunday mornings, I'm thinking worship nights, we should do like big worship nights maybe every other month, something like that. It's just kind of where I am. I don't know. I haven't landed on it yet. But like Sunday is central teaching, but Sunday is a gathering of house churches. It's what most of us have typically had as small groups or missional communities or home teams or whatever you call like that, but you actually function as a church. So if, like, if there's need in your house church, you do it take from yourselves and fix it and solve it. And if somebody loses their job, you help them get on their feet. And if they're being lazy bums and not going and looking for jobs, then you go, hey, we're not going to support you anymore. Right? And there's pain and sorrow and we're going to get into that. And that's kind of mixed gender. I was thinking uh, for, the, for the two or three, that should probably be same, same sex, like dudes and females, just because every time I've been in a scenario with dudes, it's like, like hey, I'm wrestling with this pornography thing, right? And, and females just don't get that. They're like, why? And then the guys are like, I don't know, why do you feel like you ought to buy everything, you know? And it's like, there's just this misunderstanding of like, I've got this thing that you don't get, and, but other dudes do, and, and females got this thing, They're just, we're just different. Like God just made us different. And so for the accountability of like, hey, I'm dominated by this, like, it's, it's, a, it's a good plan. So house churches are mixed gender and there's kids in there and it's, it's a church like in the New Testament. 
Like they went to temple together and they broke bread and they met in small groups and then they met in, in houses, okay? And then what? And then intentional outreach, okay? Personal evangelism and apologetics, I've already hit that. I want you trained up to be able to sit down with your coworkers, with your peers, with your family members, with um, your neighbor, with teammates, with whoever, right? Like it's just being able to sit down and at least begin the conversation, right? Where you do it. Right, this is Ephesians 4. Ephesians 4 is that God gave uh, what is it? Uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the, building up, or for the work of ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ. Okay, so you're the ministers. I'm a trainer. So like my understanding of what we do here is I'm Mickey, you're Rocky. Okay? Well, you got to hit him on a rock, right? So we're going to do that. That's going to be Sunday morning, but you've got to get in the ring and you've got to engage. Okay? So that's uh, how we're going to reach out. Secondly is benevolence to widows, orphans, the poor, and the oppressed. Okay? I've, I've hit this a number of times, but we want to actually be good to Missoula. Like, we want to love Missoula. I uh, saw... So, um, title from a guy attacking Christianity said Christian or religion religion ruins everything or how religion ru ruins everything right and if you're not coming from a, a Christian's perspective I can get that are we actually good for Missoula are we good to those who are hurting who are broken who are oppressed right are we good to the poor the widow the orphan because that's a big deal in the Bible and lastly is digital missions um, I, I think God gave us Facebook you know Right, do you realize how many people you can reach? And the kind of truth that you can throw out, right? Do you understand like the, the reach that you have through YouTube and Instagram and things like that? And I just want to really leverage that. That's very much a, a here's where we, where we are at this point in history in our lives. It's like, are you light on Facebook? Right? Or are you bringing rage and wrath and vulgarity and profanity? Are you being all the things of the world into this area where you could bring tremendous light. The idea is this. We are called to engage. You cannot fulfill your job description as a disciple of Jesus by simply being in your house, praying, connecting, loving God just by yourself. Now you're supposed to receive of him and then go out into the world. So challenging stuff. It was a challenging message for me to write, for me to sit through and really just kind of ask, man, what of this applies to me? But I'll ask you that now. What applies to you? Are you salt? Are you light? Are you engaging the world? Do you know Jesus? Are you filled with his Holy Spirit and then going out into the darkness? Or are you watching the news and watching social media and, and just wringing your hands? going, oh, what's going to happen? What's going to happen? What's going to happen? You're going to happen. Jesus has redeemed you. He has saved you. He's given you his Holy Spirit. You are what is going to happen to the darkness in the world. Your salt, your light. That's what we're going to do here, right? We are going to engage. I said it last week. We're going to take our hits. We're going to take our licks. But we have each other and we have Christ, right? Challenging words from Jesus. Your salt your light, salt loses its saltiness by being diluted, light gets covered up by fear and apathy. What cut deepest? I'm going to ask you to bow your heads, I'm going to ask you to close your eyes. I'm going to ask you to come before the Lord now and do some soul searching. Maybe something I've said just stood out. That like when we're in here, we're doing these these sermons uh, and, and these teachings and trainings. Um, God will point things out to you, right? He will say, "Hey, this this is for you. This is what I need you to think about. This is what I need you to sit down of. This is the thing that you need to turn away from. You need to repent from." So I ask you that. What is that? Take a moment as we prepare our hearts for communion. Take a moment and ask God, what would you have me do with this? It might be for some of you, someone that he put on your heart and mind that you need to go and talk to. Some substantial conversation that you need to begin to say, hey, what do you believe and how'd you get there? And just have that talk. Some, some of you, it might be a person. Some, it might be fear. Like, I've got to wrestle down this fear and ask this question. How big is my God? Do I truly know God? Am I filled with the Holy Spirit? Does Jesus know me. 
Am I having an impact on the world around me like I am called to do? We are not called to hide. We are called to go and make disciples and engage.